Uh, thanks a lot for coming. I understand that actually the slot at 2 p.m. is quite a tough one because you kind of had some lunch and it's already been one and a half days of this conference, so you've heard a lot. And I have to work very hard to stand out of this so you can at the end still remember what I've said. Um, I will try to fulfill that kind of requirement or that promise, but well, as far as promises go. Um, interestingly, Actually, the title is not totally correct. Because when I submitted this, I was speaking about future technologies. Guess what? Future is today. So the future catch up with us. Uh, so this is no longer, well, one of them is still a future technology. The other one is actually a pretty present one. Just released fresh out of the oven. And you will see what I mean. So I can skip that slide, because we already have that introduction. Maybe for you to know a little bit about the background, I'm, I'm also working with the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, and a lot of the stuff I'm talking about is basically coming from that channel. Well, um, defending against man in the middle. Probably I'm in a very fortunate spot that here at OWASP I don't have to explain too much about man in the middle attacks in general, I think. Uh, so this will be much easier. I will start with a little bit talking about past attacks and breaches that we've seen in last year, uh, because they basically led up to a number of the developments we, are, we have been making over the last 18 months. Uh, then talking about the general kind of insufficiencies that we see with channel detection, and then basically leading to the two possible solutions that we will implement very, very soon. So, past breaches. Um, probably you all read in 2011, we had quite some interesting news about CAs and their breaches. Uh, actually, I believe just one hour ago, there was a presentation about uh, from a guy from Komodo, yeah. PHP, from this Iran war case. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have time to go to this one, so I went to another. But I, I'm definitely going to see the video. Uh, because it might actually have conflicting input to what, I, what I'm saying. <laughs> Still, uh, I think the, the main message should be, yes, we had a breach, and there were a number of uh, certificates uh, signed uh, in, in a fake way for seven domains at that time. That was actually in March 2011, so last year in spring. That was kind of a minor news coming out at that time. And uh, as you all know, uh, as we also, uh, during that presentation before, one hour before, Komodo is still around. So nothing bad had happened to them so far. Well, but there is another party, and party kind of in all types of senses, literally, um, which happened then in 2011 in June. Actually, the date is not totally clear, but it was discovered on June 19. There was another breach to a CA. Maybe I should actually ask the room, who of you knows what a certificate of authority is, what a CA is? Great. OK, that makes it easy. So I don't have to explain what a CA is. Um, and in that case, it was DG Notar. So um, and in that case, it was really kind of getting really bad. So they, they uh, a hacker managed to issue a number of wildcard certs uh, for Google and a number of other kind of uh, companies. And the tour project, in the end, kind of found uh, they they did event, uh, extensive updates on this, and they in the end they found 531 fraudulent certificates were issued by the attacker. So you can imagine a number of sites were basically exposed by that. Um, and in August 28, there were some certificate problems being no noticed uh, by multiple internet service providers in Iran. So what happened at that time was actually that there were some servers in the middle, some ISP servers who kind of injected and used these fake certificates to then reopen the channel to, to the main server. And, and the users would connect via these fake certificates and basically expose all their private data, all their user credentials, passwords, and all their emails and all this stuff. So if you, for example, using Gmail and you were sitting in Iran at that time, Basically, your email was, was being read by the government or whoever was sitting behind these ISP servers. Which was, if you remember at that time, not a healthy position to be in. 
because there was this kind of certain unrest or kind of unhappiness of people. So if you at that time were writing your emails maybe to your friend, hey, the government sucks, <laughs> you might actually have received a visit of someone to convince you otherwise <laughs> by whatever means necessary. So actually quite, a, you know, this is not only about money, this is not only about your privacy, this could be quite serious for people. Um, fortunately, uh, in this case, actually the browser renders took quite drastic measures and uh, quite justified. And on August 30, um, I think it was basically all of them, but Mozilla, I, I felt Mozilla was the first, but well, I might not be perfectly right. On August 30, Mozilla removed DigiNota certificates from their list of trusted CAs. And um, well, that was basically the end of DigiNota certificates. Because uh, if you're no longer listed as a trusted source in, in, a, in a browser, then well, what's the whole point of operating? Because um, the only point for you selling these certificates is that people trust you. And if people don't trust you anymore, well, that's it. And well, uh, just one month later, actually only 21 days later, DigiNota filed for bankruptcy. So yeah, quite a, quite a, quite a steep rise and decline for them. Um, there's an interesting remark to this. So in this case, actually, uh, many browser users were exposed. But interestingly, Chrome users were not, at least not for the Google accounts. So they were co um, exposed for the remaining 500 odd something certificates, but not for accessing Google. So it was kind of a, a, an interesting artifact. And that was because actually, Google did something they were able to detect fraudulent certificates uh, accessing Google servers. I mean, they, they kind of did this for their own domain by pinning, by, by basically listing a number of Google certificates that they trust. And if it's anything else, then they knew it's not from themselves. So in, in a little bit learning from this, we, we will come to the solutions that are actually uh, now building up to provide this for everybody. Chrome, Chrome detected it. Chrome basically had a list. I mean, actually, Google didn't really speak about it. But Chrome had a list internally of certificates that would be allocated to Google. And well, then there was suddenly one more, kind of. And, and the Chrome browser kind of noticed, oh, this is not in my list. This is kind of strange. OK. Um, so. In a number of cases, what you see for man in the middle attacks when it comes to transport layer security attacks is you have, obviously, you have a guy in the middle. So, and in, in these cases, you have a secure connection from the client to the server using some fake certificate. So the client actually believes everything's fine. They still see this little lock icon. They still see kind of, oh, this is all right in the browser. There's a little, little image in the address bar. So for, for them, everything looks fine. On the other hand, I'm sorry. On the other hand, the server also has a, an encrypted channel and also believes, oh, everything's fine because actually somebody's talking to me in encrypted communication. So both sides are quite happy. And the man in the middle using that fight certificate is very happy too because he can read everything you send to him and then just pass it on. That happens if you have access to these fake certificates by one of these CAs. Um, well, now, now there's kind of a, a bad thing with these C, CA certificates and with this trust model. And the problem is that basically if one of these, you have a very large number of trusted CAs listed in your browsers, a very large number. And you know they can actually sign certificates for any domain. So it's not like... CAA could only list, could only search for, for example, Google. But everyone can make certificates for Google or for your company. So thinking about you have hundreds of CAs in about 46 jurisdictions or countries. And now imagine you need to breach only one. Only one single CA you need either to breach as an attacker or as a government. 
Because if the government goes to these kind of companies in their country and says, well, you really have to do this for me, they really have to do this for them. So that means they can actually also influence on getting these certificates. Think about Secret Service or something like that. So if a single one of them is broken, basically all your TLS SSL domains are prone to this attack. So only one of them needs, to bre needs a breach and basically we are all thinking about what can we do with this model. Um, yeah, here's some more statistics. So from the EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, they have an SSL observatory and they listed about uh, 1,400 certificates are trustable, which is from about 1,000 uh, CA certificates, uh, which is from about 1,100 distinct issuing issuers from about 650 organizations. So, so imagine one out of 650 a breach. And I think the probability for something like that happening, uh, we, we can make our estimated guess what that would be. And we saw that in 2011 with two instances that people noticed. I mean, I'm not talking about the stuff we haven't seen. So um, yeah, insufficient transport layer protection. I think that's probably known to most of us uh, because it's number nine on our OWASP top 10 list. So it's not very high on the list, but still it's high enough to be in it. And um, it's actually quite omnipresent. I mean, every website you go and where you kind of enter your, your data, if you enter your username, if you enter your password, this is, this is common. If you have your session cookie somewhere, if you get, make a bank transaction, you buy a book, you read something somewhere, uh, you enter data in a blog, you go to Facebook, so you name it. it. In all these cases, you rely on the fact that nobody in, in the middle is either reading your credentials or actually injecting, injecting content on your behalf that you may not like. So what, what, what's common, in common case, the problem? Um, some of them are not using or not mandating uh, TLS or SSL. Uh, it relies on this kind of trust relationship. So um, you, you basically hope that this certificate will be true and that you, you trust these CAs in the browser. Uh, in a number of cases, you actually have threats of leakage because, um, you know, yes, you should use SSL in every case, but uh, I guess you know that in a number of deployments, you have actually both for websites. So you have SSL access and you have non-SSL access. Funnily enough, your browser submits, for example, submits your cookies to both if they are not set to uh, set cookie state secure. But uh, well, we, we know that not everybody does play nicely. So quite, quite a number of deployments still have not this cookie and, and then that means your session is in the clear and can be grabbed by anybody sitting there. Or there are also a number of uh, applications out there who just don't use SSL. So I'm not sure, for example, who of you uses WhatsApp? I think that's a fairly common. OK, not so many. No, nobody knows what, who knows what WhatsApp is? OK, I'm not in Asia anymore. If I ask that question in Hong Kong, everybody in the, in the room raises their hand. It's, it's kind of a, a little chat application instead of SMS. It's, it's basically a free SMS over the internet. But interestingly, it doesn't use SSL encryption. So if you sit in the same. Is it, is it now? Since one month then. Because two months ago they didn't. OK, so then I stand corrected. I really have to run a, a proxy to check that. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so um, what you see is you, you basically have two normal attack paths. The first one is, of course, on the outside when you go to the, to the app application server, and the second one is than potentially internal people. Yeah, the comment was that a lot of people start their journey on HTTP uh, by just entering this into the browser. And well, then they come to the login page, enter something, or enter their data, and they, they submit an HTTP, or a man in the middle just removes the SSL in the future. Yeah, very, very well. I come to this in a minute. Actually, this one. Uh, so so you're, 
You have prescience. You, you can see the future of divination. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> uh, or you were in one of my other presentations. Who knows? Actually, Facebook fixed it. So uh, I think last year you could still do uh, go to the web page and wouldn't have a redirect. Now they do a redirect to HTTPS before you do the login. But do you? Does your web application do this in all cases? I still see quite a number of them out there where I don't get a mandatory redirect to SSL before I submit my uh, credentials. <coughs> so, so again, this is fixed. So in this case, they are fine. But <coughs> there are quite a number of them out there. Yeah, it's nice. You do the post, and everything is fine. But Actually, the channel over which you are posting is open. So yeah, nice try. Uh, there are three common attack vectors for um, weak channels. There is SSL downgrading, SSL stripping, and the use of fake certs. So um, fake certs is basically this, the, the case where you have a breach to a CA that I started with uh, my presentation. So if, if you manage to get into one of these 650 entities, then you get your fake cert. And you can sign this for Google, for Microsoft, for HSBC. Name the interested party you kind of want to listen in. Um, the second one is SSL downgrading, which is a little bit kind of an artifact from the past, where some of the browsers were not able to uh, do the full SSL encryption with all with the very strong algorithms and to support um, compatibility we kind of uh, acknowledge that and uh, allowed in, in a number of cases well we should be allowing even weaker algorithms a weaker one is better than none so the server could reply and say well actually I don't support uh, 256 so let's only talk 50 something or 48 and then yeah, uh, basically you would have a very weak encryption only and that could be reached within minutes. The problem with this is if either side of, or no, both sides of them would theoretically allow this, but both would be willing to do the maximum strength. If you have a person in the middle, he can basically start talking to the left side and say, oh, I don't speak this strong stuff. I, I only speak the soft stuff. Then he comes back. And then he hands this back to the, to the server and says, oh, I also don't speak the strong stuff. So with one person in the middle, if, I, if both sides are willing to go down, then they will go down. Uh, fortunately, in most cases, at least in the modern browsers, we are away from this SSL downgrading. But also, as you know, there are still plenty of um, lower version browsers out there who are quite willing and um, accommodating on downgrading your SSL. And again, with this, you basically have full access then to the channel. So if you're sitting in an internet cafe, in a hotel, at a conference, and there's somebody sitting in between, yeah. Um, and the third one is SSL stripping. Um, there's a very kind of smart guy, Moxie Marlinspike. Probably you all heard of him. Um, I like his tools. I'm not always of the same opinion with him. Um, <coughs> But this one is really cool because basically the, the, the client will go there and he, the client will see, OK, this is a non-encrypted server. And there's kind of no hints for that you really have to be encrypted. While the server kind of has a normal happy SSL encrypted line. And this basically will strip out everything that's kind of, it will strip out SSL redirects. It will strip out server cookies and all these kind of things. Quite sophisticated, actually, meanwhile. So it will strip out the secure attribute of all cookies, uh, encodings in the request, if modified sins, redirects. So, so the, for the client, if, if you don't start with SSL, you will never end up in SSL. And for the server, you will always kind of think everything's fine. Quite a nice <laughs> device. So you have basically three methods on, on getting to this, on getting into the data. Um, there are a number of kind of mechanisms that we as OWASP recommend. First of all is use TLS on all connections with sensitive data. 
uh, use standard strong algorithms, as I said, to avoid this downgrading and really make it mandatory. Uh, manage your keys, verify the certificates before using them. In, in a number of cases, people don't verify or don't look for revocation. And use proven mechanisms uh, if possible. And there's, again, this little uh, nice cheat sheet that we have, just as a kind of reminder. I'm sorry, probably all of you have heard and read it, but I, I, like, I really like our cheat sheet series. So how to deal with this? Um, maybe first kind of to introduce some of the players. Uh, of course, OWASP was one of the players. We had a browser security day at the OWASP summit in 2011. And at that time, we kind of uh, discussed about these problems and how to solve it. Uh, the ITF with the Web Security Working Group, they, they talk about kind of internet standards and, and really how to deploy this. Browser vendors and a number of secure websites with critical information like PayPal, banks, eBay, and the likes. And of course, also some great security researchers like Chris in the back. <laughs> um, so what's been done and what's coming? We have worked on HSTS, um, actually it's HTTP Strict Transport Security. The short acronym is HSTS, so sorry for that. Cert pinning and uh, another working group is working on PLS cert pinning and DNSSEC. So first of all, the, the, the easiest one, and that's already there, now, today. That's basically the, the future that we are, that just catch up with us. Um, this is just a normal HTTP header, very simple. And the only thing this header says is, I will always talk SSL. If anyone talks to you from my domain in plain language, it's not me. So the consequence of this is if a browser kind of goes to a site and notices, oh, this request is not SSL, first, he will turn to SSL. And second, if this doesn't work, it will fail. So it will automatically convert all HTTP requests into HTTPS requests, which mitigates kind of a lot of these uh, man in the middle, downgrading scenarios, and, and, and these cases. But if you have, say, in HTTP? No. Um, yeah, there's, there's two. Yes and no. First, it will say it in a, normally in an encrypted channel. So you have to start first with an SSL encrypted channel. Then you get this information. Um, so this, this leads actually to the trust on first use scenario and the bootstrapping problem. So how do you kind of tell a person who has never been to the internet before, who has never been to your site, how can this person rely on that this is kind of still true? That's, I guess, what you mean. And um, yeah, that's still a problem, because you still have this. Uh, a number of people have the hope that you will start your computer in a kind of semi-trusted environment at the beginning, which is, I know, which is kind of far, far-fetching. And the second bit is that actually some of the browsers or some of the browsers will come with a preloaded uh, HSTS cache, so you will already have for some major sites this in it, but not for all of them. Um, the good thing about this is it's really simple. So setting this header is yeah, I think this is the easiest thing to do. Uh, you basically have uh, a max age, which is which means how long will this header persist? This should be in the range of days or months. So uh, we are not talking about seconds. So, for example, if if you take your computer, go to a different location, this stuff is still in your cache, and if you encounter a man in the middle there, you will notice. Uh, it can include subdomains or not. That's an option. That's kind of uh, for you to choose. Well, no, no, no. It, it will, it, there's no okay. There's no okay. With these tools, there's no click uh, by dummy user. Yes, I want to be hacked. No, no, no. <laughs> this is kind of in in these cases. The, the the nice thing is that the server tells the client, yes, we are sure, this is what we want, and it kind of gives the browser confidence in in not letting you click through. Actually, this will also give you trouble if you start with something like self-signed certs. So if, if you can't use a self-signed cert and then just click through, if, if you use that 
uh, header. And the very nice thing, actually, there are already first deployments, including PayPal, for example. Um, the second bit, uh, which is uh, derived from uh, work from Google and from Chris. Actually, it's Chris's work. I'm just presenting that. Um, and the working group's work. So um, how, could, how could Google Chrome be so resilient? The fact was they basically have this preloaded fingerprint already in their, in their browsers. And the interesting bit is server identities tend to be long-lived. But you know, when you go there, you basically always start your, your, your session very new. And, and you keep your session maybe for a couple of minutes. Then you go out, and then you start a new session. And you would have to verify again that this fingerprint is there. But due to Yes, it creates a bootstrapping problem and a chicken egg problem. Um, you know, these things help you, but they are not kind of the silver bullet. Um, again, here, actually, you have more than a chicken egg problem. You also have a uh, risk. The scene one, so that's the update mechanism. So you, you talk SSL and you get a new SERP pinning header, then you update your entry. Quite simple. So for example, if you would start surfing in Iran, maybe you start being pinned to the wrong surfs. You might notice this when you leave Iran to surf in the US, and suddenly kind of you see different surfs. Um, there is some way around this by preloading browsers for, let's say, more common, very kind of common sites. Um, and Attackers with ISP capabilities, as I said, for example, in Iran may actually try to, to
basically we have signed entries in DNS which are integrity protected. And so you, you can go actually, you always go to your DNS server for, for getting your domain resolution to the IP address. And in this case, you could also get uh, certificates linked to the domain. Unfortunately, rolling out and deploying DNSSEC is quite a feat. And it takes for, for ages. It takes very long time. So the great thing of DNSSEC is you don't have this bootstrapping problem because you go to the DNS server and uh, there you already have this trust chain of trust. So all this trust on first use is much easier for you. The disadvantage is it will take probably another few years to be there. Yes, please. You don't have the blue tracking problem because the OS has the uh, address or yeah, the because yeah, because the OS has, has the link to the trusted DNS and the, the DNS is, uh, is signed and you have the root servers, so, so you already have a chain of trust there. I mean, that could also theoretically be breached, but uh, this is quite a few, uh, this is really difficult to breach in my view. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I will not go into this. Um, there's also another method. Um, that's something uh, Moxie presented about a year ago. Uh, I just want to mention this. I'm, I don't think this is going to happen, but it's, it's a nice idea where you basically, you don't actually ask a CA for trust, but you actually ask other people whether they see the same cert coming from this site. And if you add a lot of friends, you basically, it's like going to all your friends and seeing and asking, hey, do you see the same? And then hoping that the man in the middle is not sitting between you and uh, between the target and all your friends, which is in, in a number of cases a fair assumption. However, it, it's nice because you don't have the centralized trust uh, situation anymore. Mm -hmm. And you could equally work with um, self-signed certificates in these cases. Um, but the, the trust structure of the large vendors and uh, of how large internet operators work is not exactly how this model would, would look like. And also it's difficult for a normal user, at least in my humble opinion, to decide on which friends do you want to trust. I mean, who kind of, who are the ones you would ask? Yes, probably guys like us in the room who, are, who have the geek head. <laughs> so what, what do we have to do? What, what do we have now? What do we have today? And um, the nice thing is uh, this HSTS header you have today. So uh, it just passed um, internet review and it is now basically in the final editing stage where people just iron out the grammatical errors that you might still have in the text. So this is stable, you can use, you can go to this graph and use it. And I strongly recommend that you do. And a number of browsers already support it. So um, uh, specifically uh, Mozilla and Chrome, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, okay, he doesn't correct me, good. Um, third pinning, I still hope that we're gonna have this in Q1 2013. Our initial plan was something for Q3, Q4 of this year, but well, the internet is not as fast as it should be sometimes, especially when it comes to long-standing solutions. And uh, the ITF very much believes in better do something right than do it too fast. And well, that's kind of the, pay, the price we have to pay for it. And TLS in the NSSEC, well, you know kind of this variable <coughs> where we don't really know when this is going to happen. But if this is going to happen, it, it will be a very nice addition. So my recommendation would be uh, for you to start using uh, this HTS, HSTS header as soon as you can because it will mitigate a lot of these downgrading SSLs, uh, man in the middle risks um, very, very easily. It scales tremendously because it's just an HTTP header. So I mean, this is, this is the easiest, simplest solution you can ever choose. Yeah, this is kind of, um, if you have in ideas, feedback, or actually if you want to participate in the third pinning discussion, uh, that's still a little bit ongoing. We still have to solve one or two questions. Then please feel free to join the ITF website working group, or just drop me an email and I will kind of point you towards where to go. Okay, the question just for the audience uh, on, the, on the video is whether you, would, whether you would use the trusted 
preloaded domains as kind of notaries for bootstrapping the other domains. Yeah. Is that kind of disseminating that information? Yeah. Might be nice. Uh, I'm not sure whether these preloaded domains would agree to being kind of mis or abused for disseminating the information for more others. And, and then you would need an, a registration model for that. Because they are not talking to the individual people. They are talking to these 650 CAs. And that's quite a lot easier than talking to one million. Other questions? OK, um, I'm ahead of time. Thank you very much for your time and for coming. I hope I could keep you awake. OK, see you.